Okay, greetings. Welcome to the Transforming Assessment webinar series. Um, this is the 7th of November. Today's session by Christopher Sagwin from the University of Birmingham in the UK is on the automatic assessment of mathematics. Um, Chris, would you like to start by clicking the next slide and we'll get underway. Now remember to click the talk button to speak. Yeah, thanks Matthew. Hello everyone. <laughs> I'll just show my video briefly. Um, the sun is rising outside my office window this morning. It looks like a beautiful autumn morning. So uh, I just might be a good idea if everyone can raise their hands if you can actually hear me and, uh, and let me get underway. Is the audio okay? Okay, great. I'm going to turn the video off just to preserve to preserve bandwidth while we uh, while we while we run the session. Um, so I'm going to thank you very much for inviting me to to give this webinar. I'm going to talk about automatic assessment of mathematics, something I've been working on for a while, and I'm going to illustrate that talk with the Stack Online Assessment System. Um, this is some software that I've written and developed with a number of other people. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge the United Kingdom MSOR network. Um, they've been very supportive of this work for the last 10 years. That network's now finished. And uh, over the last year, I particularly want to thank the United Kingdom Open University, Phil Butcher and Tim Hunt, who I've collaborated with since January to produce a new version of the software. I think, uh, so this is the outline of my talk. Um, online assessment is here to stay, and there are lots of examples of this going back 50 years. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about some of those. I want to argue why and illustrate my talk why mathematics really needs special tools. We, we, really need, um, we really need these special tools. But that special tool requires some sophisticated understanding. If you're going to automate something, you need to understand it. And, um, and that requires a slight change of mindset from teachers. Uh, well, how do students react? Um, I'd like to talk about some of our students' reactions. We've been using this kind of software for 10 years now, and the students' reactions to it are fairly consistent, so there's some things we can learn there. And then I'd like to talk about some new opportunities. Every assessment format has its affordances and constraints. Multiple choice questions are very simple, uh, but they have their problems. Essay questions are very open-ended, but they're expensive to mark, and so on. And similarly, with these kinds of automated assessments, <coughs> excuse me, there are some things they're very good for, uh, there are some things they're just not designed to do. And there are some new opportunities. There are some things that we didn't expect. In particular, uh, the effect of generating random problems for students and some open-ended problems that traditionally we wouldn't ask. And then I'll just be honest at the end about some unsolved difficulties, in particular the issue of uh, human-computer interaction and syntax, and then also the issue of server load, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is a serious practical issue. <coughs> Before I started that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my philosophy of teaching, because that's important. And in my mind, at least, I split mathematical activity into two important strands. And they're extreme positions. Uh, and it's sometimes useful to retreat to extreme positions, I think, just for the purposes of argument. The first of these is the use of routine techniques. And I really mean practice. So you can see here in the little photo, this is Joseph Phillips' copybook from 1858. Age 10, this, this child is uh, doing his long division. And he you know, looks like he's uh, dividing up packets of tobacco here all beautifully laid out in this lovely handwriting. And anyone, anyone who's learnt any maths, I'm sure everyone here has learnt quite a lot of maths, will, will have done lots of practice, uh, practice of routine techniques. And you need to, of course, recognise which technique you need to use. Often you'll be you'll just learn something, so you'll be told, use long division or whatever it is. So you'll have to recognise what you need to do, but then it's a standard problem. It's, you, you, reduce something in, you reduce your problem into a standard form, you apply an algorithm, and one of the goals is accuracy, and I think, uh, I think that's what Joseph's doing here. He's got to do his long division accurately, and that's the most important thing. It's deeply unglamorous, and um, it's a lot of hard work. And then, <laughs> uh, but then we compare that with, with problem solving, which is the second strand. And problem solving requires 
novelty, creativity, you have to struggle by definition, and if you get that far, then you'll be satisfied that you solved the problem. And I think these two strands are inseparable because if you're practiced and you know what you're doing, then something becomes routine, and if you haven't seen it before, it's a problem. You only have to think about the way calculus has developed into a systematic set of tools for reducing certain kinds of problems down into routine exercises, and that, that's why we practice them, so that we can become good at things we're likely to have to do. Now, computer-aided assessment, the kind of computer-aided assessment I'm going to demonstrate today, is certainly most useful for one. It's really not going to be so useful, I think, for the kinds of novel creative problem solving. But, but it's still an important part of what we're doing. It's just a tool that's most useful for assessing these kinds of routine techniques. So, we should look at it in that context. It's, it's not a tool that's going to assess every kind of mathematics activity, and it's not designed to but uh, I think it's got its place for certain things. So that said, um, I'd just like to talk about multiple choice questions in particular. Um, and I want to just say straight away, I think multiple choice questions are wholly inadequate for mathematics in particular. And the reason why, to anyone who's taught mathematics, I hope will agree that for in mathematical teaching in particular, many of the routine algorithms that we teach and teach for good reasons, are reversible processes. Sorry, did someone put their hand up there briefly? Okay. Uh, no. So a lot of reversible processes. Uh, and here's one. Uh, finding the symbolic antiderivative of this expression. And um, if we set this as a multiple choice question, we would have to probably, well, we'd certainly have to produce a number of potential answers. One of them would be correct, and a number of them would be not correct for various reasons. But basically, we give the game away. And I'm, I would want my students to appreciate that differentiation is significantly easier than integration. And I don't think this would be a valid assessment of integration as a multiple choice question, because the sensible student is simply going to reverse the process and differentiate instead. So I'm not testing the thing I want to test. What I'd much rather do is set this kind of problem as a, uh, what I'd much rather do is set this problem as a multiple choice question. Okay, now uh, a moment ago, so I'm going to share my, share my, um, share my desktop. Can you just put your hands up if you can see the, uh, Oh, great, thanks, good. Thanks, guys, that's great. So this is the, um, this is the stack software, which I'm going to demonstrate. It's, stack is now a question type for the Moodle quiz. So Moodle is a content management system. And you can see here that I've embedded, I've, I've jumped straight in, I've logged in as the admin user for reasons I'll demonstrate later, I want full access. So this is the admin user testing um, a quiz. We've got the home, we've got courses, stack demo, demonstration quiz, demonstration quiz, I'm in the preview. So I've jumped straight in here to save time. And I'm going to answer this question. So would someone like to chat an incorrect answer? Uh, It's almost a, uh, just chat the potential five. Okay, there we go. Thanks, Teresa. So if we um, check the answer five. Now, I have to apologize in advance that I'm using my local host. who have had a power cut here last night, and I can't access our main servers. So I'm doing this all locally. And so the first step, the student enters their answer, and then the second step establishes the properties that the answer has. Well, all right, this isn't a very interesting answer, but I hope you can gauge the idea of the, <laughs> sorry to it, uh, gauge the properties that the system's trying. So the system knows this is wrong, incorrect answer, and look at the feedback. The derivative of your answer should be to the expression of your answer incorrect. That was so and so. In fact, the derivative of your answer perspective, this you must have done something wrong. So I'm going to do something a bit more. Um, 
So I'm going to do something a little bit more mathematical with a little bit more syntax in it. Notice the students in this setup can try again. The system, the students have to type their answer using a one-dimensional syntax. The system echoes their answer using traditional notation. And here in the feedback, the feedback uh, actually contains the derivative of the student's answer. So the design of this feedback is based on the student's answer, so it's genuinely feedback uh, to what the student has typed. This isn't some pre-matched string. Um, it's doing a mathematical calculation, establishing properties of the student's answer. The feedback is based on the student's answer, and I hope I authored this feedback. We could argue about, about the merits of it, but I hope this feedback, at least in this case, signals to the students how they could check their own answer and therefore how they can improve on the task. So the, the research evidence shows that feedback which helps students improve on the task and task-based feedback is, is the most effective feedback. So that's the basic idea and then there are a number of other, so I'm going to show you a number of other similar questions just to illustrate the sorts of things this system can do. So here is a basic algebra question. A uh, rectangle has length 9 centimetres greater than its width. If it has an area of 52 centimetres squared, find the dimensions of the rectangle. And here I have chosen to break down the question into parts. So x plus 9 equals 52. And uh, I guess the answer x equals uh, the answer are set of numbers. And so I guess that's going to be 43. Isn't it? So this illustrates a number of things. There are multi-part questions. The students can answer the parts in any order. We still have this mark validate protocol. The student's answer can be some kind of mathematical expression. So here that's an equation, and here it's a set of numbers. So there we go. Um, there are various things the teacher can expect. I, I wanted to, I I've chosen here as a teacher, um, because I know if I put two answer boxes, the students will pick up that it's a quadratic, for example. Um, and I don't want empty answer boxes. So I don't want to tell the students how many solutions to expect, which would might invalidate the assessment. So there we are. The students empty your answer as a set of numbers. And let's look at the feedback. Uh, they've got it right, even though they've got the first part wrong. So we can, we can automate follow-through marking. Now, I think follow-through marking is mostly an artifact of a paper-based format. All question formats have their... Um, benefits and disadvantages. I think, I think, I think personally, um, I'm not so keen on following through marking in an automated system because, well, they get the immediate feedback, so they can just do this part again and get it right. I mean, it can be x times x plus 9 is 52, and then if we, they can just do it again. So why do we need follow through marking? Now, I've put this in here because this illustrates that this answer is invalid and there's a crucial difference in my system between validity and correctness and I'll come back to that later but this answer has been rejected so it, the system's not going to consider it um, but it's important that students have a valid answer and that that's different from a wrong answer and there are all sorts of reasons why something might be invalid and we'll come back to that later but that just illustrates that here uh, the next question what's the next question Okay, another, I mean, I'm sure we, anyone who's taught calculus will have found, find the tangent line, equation of the tangent line at a certain point. So, um, again, this has got follow through marking, differentiate, evaluate your derivative, hence find the tangent line. This might not be the only method of solving this problem, um, but there are other methods to solve this problem. But here, the teacher's decided that this is the method that's going to be used, and so it provides a structure. And notice, to avoid the syntax problem, the student might type y equals mx plus c. To avoid that, the teacher has added a little signpost that they only want the right-hand side of the equation, mx plus c. That just helps with the establishing properties. The railway journey. So we can have a system of equations. In a railway journey of 90 kilometers, an increase of 5 kilometers per hour in the speed decreases the time taken by 5 minutes. We write a system of equations. So 90 equals b times t. So that's certainly the initial journey, and then the same journey is v plus 5. That's the increase in the speed times t minus 15. Um, so I, as a student, I'm going to get some feedback on this immediately. So we can type in a system of equations in any order. Now, I've deliberately got this wrong in a particular way. Um, 
here, there's a common mistake, and we know there's a common mistake because we've used this question with students. And uh, so you can also check not just for a correct answer, but as with multiple choice questions, good multiple choice questions are, are written based on the knowledge of things people are likely to get wrong. So you can still have all that knowledge of what students are likely to get wrong, and if you know that in advance, you can program that in behind the scenes to check and establish that the student's answer is consistent with a particular mistake. And here my answer is particular. I, I've, I've got speeding kilometers per hour, but I've used 15 minutes, so I've got my time limits mis mistake. It's a very common sort of thing to do. We know that, so we can provide that feedback. Uh, I haven't given the game away completely, but uh, I, I guess I have. But we can certainly provide the sort of feedback you would with a multiple choice question, but we just don't have to give the game away. All right, here's another more open-ended question, and I've demonstrated this one before, but this illustrates some of the things that we can do which are more open-ended. So let's have a look at this question. Give an example of an odd function by, by typing an expression which represents it. So would someone like to chat a potential answer to this? So, an odd sine x. Okay, let's try that. Great. And a function which is odd and even. Would someone like to try and get this wrong? Okay, cos x. Well, all right, Greg. Thanks, Greg. I'm going to do something that's even, isn't it? Let's do something that's odd and even. So let's go for x cubed times cos x, because that's going to be odd and even. So we've got the, again, we've got the double submission, the validate, and then the mark. This looks a bit cumbersome, but experience really, really stressed strongly to me that it's valuable to have this separation of validation and uh, marking in a two-step process. Well, there we go. It's partially correct. Your answer is not an even function. Look. So the, the properties that the system is establishing is that is to take f of x minus f of minus x. The computer out of the system underneath is, is calculating that. It's not zero, so it hasn't established the hasn't established the property that we wanted. So there we go. <coughs> Great. Question six. Give a function which uh, is another given example. Give an example of a function with a stationary point of x equals three, which is continuous but not differentiable at x equals naught. So again, we'll just do something which is continuous and has a stationary point. I mean, maybe that's not a good example here because uh, is is this three the state? indicating the stationary point is that three, so we'll just change that. The students can change their answer at any point, so that's another reason for echoing it back in the traditional notation. And then when the student's happy that the system is interpreted correctly, it will establish the properties and it's partially correct, so it's differential with x equal naught, but it shouldn't be. So we might might need to use abject somewhere in the answer to, to, to bend the function if you like and a break differentiability at that point. A uh, couple more questions. I've already, I already answered this one before we started, just to check everything was working, and so the system stalled my responses. Consider this real function. Uh, it's 1 for x less or equal to minus 1. It's some polynomial between minus 1 and uh, 2, and then we want psi pi, sine pi of x for x greater or equal to 2. And I've plotted the, the, the bits that we've already got. And the question asks the student to find the cubic polynomial which makes f continuously differentiable. So this is a classic cubic spine problem. I guess we would teach something like this in our second year in calculus and algebra course here at Birmingham. And I've just typed in some cubic. And the system has established various properties of my answer. In, and the way that this system is marked 
its answer is to actually separate out the properties. So each property is, is separate. I'm not establishing algebraic equivalence with the right answer here. I'm really going through each of the individual properties. So it doesn't satisfy the right interpolate, it doesn't satisfy the right derivative. In fact, the only thing I've got right is that it is a cubic and it goes through that point at, the, uh, at x equals 2. And the system has plotted the graph of the student's answer as well, which is just to illustrate that that's possible. And then the last example question that I wanted to, to demonstrate is a matrix question. And this just illustrates the fact that the system can provide um, answer boxes for matrices. Sometimes you want to give the game away. It's much easier to enter answers into a structured box like that. At other times, you wouldn't want to, to tell the student how big the matrix would be. Yeah, that's a fair comment, Teresa. Um, I wonder if the button should be changed to say validate. Now, that, yes, uh, but if we go back to, if we go back to, we've had long discussions about this. If we go back to one of these multi-part questions like this, let's imagine that I um, change this to a quarter, say, and validate that. Okay, and, I, and now as a student, I'm happy with that, so I'm going to I'm going to go and type in my quadratic v squared minus one equals naught. So if we think about what's happening here, the first part is being assessed, and the second part is being validated. And um, with these multiple part questions, um, the <laughs> yeah, so we've given this a lot of thought, and in the end, we've decided that one button at the end, check, is the least confusing of the possibilities. Uh, we, did, we did in one system, one, we did try having separate buttons for each part, but then it's not clear what the student would do if they click a button. I mean, there are some constraints by the, um, there are some constraints here caused by the uh, forms-based interactions with a web server. Now, we have, we have experimented with some AJAX to automatically validate when the student stops typing and, and so on. So there are other ways the system could interact, and if anyone has suggestions of how we might improve that, I'm very open to to discuss that and trial them. I mean, we want to improve it. But for now, on the premise that we've got a single form and we're going to submit the single form, a single check button at the end is, uh, is, is what, we, what we're going with for now. Yes. Uh, the downside of Ajax is that, of course, it increases the server load. And server load currently is, the, is the, um, the, big, the big practical issue. So we're not doing things which artificially increase server load. Stack and move a product. Yes, for now, um, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a Q-type stack. Um, Q-type stack is, a, is an optional question type for the Moodle quiz. I've thrown my hat in with Moodle. Um, stack version one was a stack version one was a um, was a standalone system. Stack version two was partially integrated, and I'm just fed up of maintaining user IDs and uh, can I email my students, please, and all those other VLE options. I mean, I'm most interested in mathematical assessments. That's where my strength is. Yes, Linda, it's, a, it's an add-on. Yes, it's an optional add-on. You, you have to install it separately. Um, and it's, you, yeah, it, it installs with, well, I can give information on that later, but yes, it's an add-on. Okay, so let's pause for breath here, and um, I'll go back to my slides. Has anyone got other Thanks, Teresa. Um, anyone with any questions at this stage? Okay, so let's... Now, I'm going to skip forward because I put some screenshots in my slides. Uh, so... Okay, let's just skip forward some slides just in case those weren't working. One of the things I haven't mentioned is um, question testing. And um, one of the principles, inevitably, altering these questions is sophisticated. And the teacher wants to test the questions. And the teacher also needs to know, uh, so let's say I share my questions with you, and you want to know what feedback I've authored. So, what we've implemented behind the scenes in the authoring side are unit testing for authors. So unit testing is a concept from software engineering. And in unit testing, when you write some code, you also author in parallel with that unit tests. And unit tests codify the input-output behavior of your code. So 
If you write a function, you would also say, well, if I put this into a function, I'll get this out. And the idea of unit testing is that you should encode both typical examples and also things that try and break the system. And that's what's happening here. So as you author your stack questions, you're encouraged to author unit tests and also encode the outcomes that you expect. So in the first unit test, the input name is answer 1. The test input is TA plus C. TA is, is an internal variable that the teacher has authored for the teacher's answer. And the teacher's answer, by default, doesn't have a constant of integration. So the test case is the teacher's answer plus a constant of integration. And we can see here that the system has evaluated the random version to give us this actual expression, which is displayed here, and it's valid. So the status is it's gone to score, and these are the outcomes. There's a score of 1, there's an expected score, there's no penalty. Penalties are um, a numerical adjustment which encourage students to try again. So typically you'll get 0.1, uh, typically for me, I give my students a 10% penalty if they get the question wrong. So in the next example, we've got a penalty. But here they got it right, so there's no penalty. That was expected. The answer note is a statistical note, because if you've got random questions, we need to do some statistics later on the logical outcome, which is independent of the random numbers used. Now, we can't group over the feedback, because the feedback may well include uh, calculations of the student's answer and or things to do with the question, which will be randomly generated. So we need a logical note internally that we can group to do statistics. So the answer note gives us the logical outcome. And uh, it's true here, so, and that was expected. So the test has passed. In the second test case, uh, I've just put in the teacher's answer, which doesn't have a constant of integration. And so the system has given them no score. So I give them zero marks there, but, and they get a little penalty. So this is where we encourage the students to start again. So the student can try this question again. So actually, if they read the feedback, you need to add a constant integration, otherwise it's appears to be correct, well done. If they read the feedback and act on it, they'll get full marks, and they'll end up with 90% of the marks of this question. So the combination of penalties and scores um, forces the students to actually try the question again and respond. Now, this is part of the Moodle quiz. So if in your situation you don't want anything to do with scores, that's fine. You just switch them off in the Moodle quiz. Uh, if you don't want to give text-based feedback, of course, you can switch that off in the middle of the quiz. It depends on how you use the questions within the quiz in the context of your teaching. But all this is here. There are, there are a lot of options, quite a lot of options, for how you might use this, these question types in a, uh, a formative, a summative, or other, uh, other assessment settings. So those are the unit tests. So you, the big advantage of this also is, as uh, as a teacher that's coming to this, you borrow someone else's questions to get started. You can look at the unit tests. You can have some confidence the system is working in each of the random cases. And you can see the feedback that the other question author has implemented. And you can see how many marks. And if you don't like that, you can go back into the author and just change it. So you might want to give some partial credit here. They've basically done the right thing. Uh, you might decide you'd give them half marks, say. But at least you can see that and you can change it. So the unit testing is, is really very helpful. And one of the reasons that, yeah, so I won't show you that line. All right, so what were my design goals for stack? I wanted to generate structured random questions. I wanted the answers to contain mathematical content, so I'm not relying on multiple choice. I wanted to establish the mathematical properties of those answers, and then I wanted formative, summative, and evaluative outcomes. So typically, the text-based feedback will be formative. So we've got some formative feedback on the bottom test case here. Typically, a summative outcome would be the overall score, adjusted by some penalty on the number of attempts. And then um, the evaluative outcomes, well, that's generating statistics of what the students are doing. Very useful in the second year for improving the feedback is to find out what the students did the year before. If you can't predict what they're going to do and how they're going to get the questions wrong, you can look at what the students have done and then improve your questions for the next year. So those evaluative outcomes are these statistical answer notes which record the properties that the student has. Yes, and find common errors, exactly. So you can analyze all the system, will store everything, and you can analyze to find common errors, give feedback, all the feedback in the lecture next week, perhaps, and then improve the questions next, next year to track those common errors and provide formative feedback. Yeah, you can find out X 40% of the students do that. Exactly, that's the kind of thing. I have to say, for this version of Stack, uh, I haven't implemented all the reporting that we've had in previous versions. That's my goal over the Christmas vacation. Uh, we're using it in my teaching here in Birmingham. 
And so uh, once we've now we've got some student data, I can re-implement those reporting features so that we can really not only find out that 40% of students did this, but find out, for example, that in this particular random version there are a disproportionate number of certain errors, which might be interesting, but also might, in a summative setting, um, invalidate some of the assessments. So you might want to restrict the range of randomization to make sure the questions are fair. So in all sorts of settings, you want these statistics in the background. So we had that in Stack 2, we had a whole, whole reporting suite, and um, now I've got some student data in Stack 3, we're going to re-implement that reporting feature over Christmas. Help would be much appreciated with that, it's, a, it's an open source project, so if people would like to get involved, I'd be very, very much welcome to help. So, as I said, uh, and as is clear, I hope Stack is underpinned by some computer algebra system, and in fact it's Maxima. Maxima is a really excellent general purpose computer algebra system, here is the is a screenshot that I put in. One of the one of the one of the things about Maxim is quite an old system, and one of the strange things is the use of the colon for assignment. So this first expression means p is assigned to b x squared um, <coughs> uh, x squared minus. So we've got this colon here. P is assigned to be x squared divided by one plus x squared. There we are, and then differentiate p with respect to x, and it's symbolically calculated derivative of p with respect to x. And that's what's going on underneath this on the server. The server has Maxima on it, and Maxima is used for these mathematical tasks. It's a question type for the uh, contrib it's a contributed question type for the Moodle quiz, and the mathematics display is using MathJax. There are other Moodle filters. Um, I have just happen to like Math MathJax, and that's the filter that I'm relying on to turn the LaTeX into um, turning LaTeX into, sorry, uh, turning LaTeX into displayed version. Okay, I was just going to go back to, I was going to go back to my demonstration system and demonstrate how you can use this, the, the control plus key to increase the font size, all the math scales very nicely. And that ability of students to scale the fonts and change the fonts addresses a lot of the key accessibility requirements. Most of the students are satisfied for their accessibility requirements if they have some control over the, over the fonts. Uh, so not using, not, thanks Teresa for your interest, um, not, not using fixed fonts and not using fixed systems uh, is a really key accessibility thing and that, that's taken care of by using MathJax to a large extent. There are lots of systems trying to do the same. Uh, Calm, Math Expert, Cognitive Tutors, A Physics, WebWork, Khan Academy, many, many others. And I'm sorry if I haven't mentioned all these other systems. There's a huge community of practice in this area of people working on, uh, working on systems. The screenshot I've shown here is from Math Expert, which is highlighted, um, which is highlighted in the, in the system here. I have to say, Math Expert is, is really my favorite system. It's a desktop system from the 1980s, and I think um, uh, it's a desktop system from the 1980s, and I think it's the most mathematically sophisticated and honest. And the student can actually work through step by step a problem in their own way here. And the, the really, the really interesting thing from my point of view, from a mathematical point of view, is the way that a plus e, uh, is the way that MathExpert tracks the assumptions. So you'll notice the system has actually kept track of this hidden assumption. Uh, right from the first step, it knows that that assumption comes from there, and that's, uh, that's something that even mainstream computer algebra systems struggle with, and, and My Michael Beeson, who wrote Math Expert in the 80s, got all that design right. And I, so there's a huge community of practice of people who are, who are working on these assessment systems. And they've been doing it since the 1960s. Uh, this is the oldest paper in online assessment that I can find. Uh, Hollingsworth is using punch cards, and what they do is they uh, he would ask his students to write computer programs. They would write them in punch cards. He would then write a grader program. So he had a, he wrote a program to mark the students' programs, and he would stick all the punch cards in the machine, and he would mark 106 students in one simultaneous go. And uh, this paper is very interesting. Well, themes that we may all. Uh, <laughs> We may all have some sympathy with. He's got a lot of students, but the thing he's most interested in is how the students learn. What did the students learn? 
and his conclusion after 15 months of using his graded program was that they probably learn better with this automatic assessment. They get more feedback, it, it marks their programs, and, uh, and they learn more effectively with this, this laboratory groups. So how we use the, how we used online assessment, computer assessment in Birmingham. We've been doing this since 2000. It was set up by Dirk Hermans here, a colleague. Uh, he set up the AIM system. We then used AIM when I arrived in Birmingham in 2000 with our uh, first year calculus and algebra. We've, we've got the diagnostic tests that the students do just to, to work out where they are. We have formative open access practice. We have weekly tasks, primarily formative. We have used this online assessment for invigilated exams, but well, I don't think it's, it can ask the sort of exam questions that we mostly want to ask in exams. It's great for the practice formative work, but I'm skeptical about invigilated exams. This is really the right tool for an invigilated exam. Currently, we're really using it for formative assessments. Uh, this is the university. Uh, it's looking quite fine as the sun comes up here this morning. Uh, this is the math department. And um, we basically get very good students at Birmingham. We get excellent students. And what do they tell us? Well, it's hard work. I mean, these formative practice calculus, they formative practice calculus work. They, uh, <laughs> in their first year, a third of their first year is calculus. And in, in previous years, we've had weekly calculus quizzes. And that's formed a large part of students' practice activity. So they, they acknowledge that those quizzes are going to be these bloody quizzes. So there we go. They, they react to that. But they, they do appreciate the random questions. We give each student random questions. The questions are the same style and want the same things, but they're subtly different, which means you can talk to a friend about a certain question. They can't do it for you. That's the big surprise, I think. The students really like collaborating, and they collaborate in a way which means they don't feel they're cheating. So we originally introduced random questions essentially to reduce impersonation uh, and to reduce plagiarism. And we were quite surprised that the way the, way the random questions had this unexpected side effect. That they, the students actually feel happy collaborating and they really acknowledge the benefit of that. So the random questions, the repeated practice and the uh, ability for students to collaborate was something we're really capitalizing on. Syntax is an issue. I mean, it's probably the biggest single issue. How do I get my answers into the machine? And for their first few uses, something very low stakes is important. I know that um, we've done diagnostic quizzes early on in students' first year. The physics department in Birmingham ran a diagnostic quiz this year and last year. And students feel very uncomfortable being judged in a high stakes setting with syntax that they're not familiar with. So the syntax is a serious problem. And then these give me an example questions. This was something that we really didn't we really didn't expect. Recognize uh, what, what's one of the students said. Recognizing the turning points of functions for using question two is impressive as there are lots of functions and stationary points that can be two. actually it was one here we had and it would be difficult simply to input all the possibles. So the students do appreciate the sophistication of this. They're curious how it works. They like these open ended questions to gain their opportunity for discussion. We wouldn't ask, oh, we certainly wouldn't ask these questions if we had to mark them by hand because they are require the teacher to do significant calculations. You can't just look at the answer. You do have to think about the answer. And so we don't ask those questions in paper-based settings because they're expensive for us to mark. But online we can ask these questions and that's another example of where the format has provided an opportunity. This generating random questions in mathematics I think is quite interesting and I wanted to just say a few words about that. Students get their own random version, and you have to think very carefully about whether that's a possible question and whether it's fair. So this is again where the unit testing is really helpful to make sure the random versions, the, quest, the random versions of the question the student actually sees are. Uh, um, that's all right, Linda. Sorry. Does the syntax mean writing x squared plus one over? Well, that's a good, that's a, we'll come back to that. That's exactly, that's the key issue here, Linda. You put your finger on it. That's absolutely the key issue, and I'm going to address that in a couple of slides. Uh, generating the, so I'll just stick with random questions for now. Students get a random, a random version of the problem. So, John Mason and Alan Watson have talked about examples, just in the same way, give me an example of a function that does this. And they talk about domains of variation and ranges of permissible change. 
in the context of students' examples. What is an odd function? What do I think of as odd? Interestingly, our students very rarely think of a zero as, the, as an odd and even function. I mean, that's why I put in that other answer in that question. So why didn't they just put a zero for all three parts, which would be correct? But actually, students never do that. And here, when we're generating random questions, Yes, um, yes, we have a busy big interface. I mean, the, the, the drag map editor was integrated into previous versions of Stack, and I intend to add that as an input type so that students can build up their typing. I mean, the, the input of maths is one of these general problems, and uh, you know, busy big editors are there, and I, I think for, for some some groups of students, they're perfectly appropriate. So, integrating a busy big editor back into Stack version three is a priority. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're certainly we're certainly working on that. That's one of the things I'm working on with you know, to improve the improve the input with standard keyboard shortcuts and so on. So, back to questions. Uh, I use this phrase a question space. Is the question is the is the collection of educationally equivalent problems, and that's a uh, a very woolly definition. It's not a mathematical definition that we pass muster in a pure maths course. And in practice, what we do is we seek invariance of the steps of the work solution. I'm not the first person to be interested in this. This is Plimpton 322. It's uh, a very old tablet, so some 3,000, 3,500 years old. And it's uh, Babylonian cuneiform. These are lists of numbers. And Eleanor Robson's view in 2001 was prob that this, this book is probably a teacher's list two or three columns containing the starting parameters for sets of problems. Math teachers have wanted to set practice problems for thousands of years, and so randomly generating practice problems is certainly not new. And I think it's quite an interesting topic. This paper appeared last year in the UK Math Gazette. Oh, sorry, I didn't put Math Gazette on there. Find a non-trivial cubic. That is, a cubic with three rational zeros and three rational stationary points. If you want to ask your students to find the coordinates of the stationary points of the cubic, you might well want those to be nice numbers, to be rational. And um, this paper is very useful, very useful for randomly generating these problems. And I think generating random questions is an under undervalued professional activity. So if people have nice questions, I think we should publish these, I think we should share them. It's an interesting topic, getting our students to address these questions. Uh, is also a very, very interesting activity, and it, and it arises naturally in this desire to generate random questions. I also think the computer algebra is essential, um, and in particular, I think regular expression ma matching is wholly inadequate. Uh, it starts with randomly generating questions. Let's imagine for the moment that we would want to set this question, factorize, factorize this quadratic. The worst thing to do is to start by randomly generating the coefficients. What you do is you start with the answer, you generate uh, a random integer, uh, A, another random integer, B, and then you define the teacher's answer to be this factorized quadratic, and then we expand that out with the computer algebra system and use that to set the question. So we do everything in reverse. And that's where, going back to our definition of question space, let's go back a few slides, the question space is the collection of instances which are educationally equivalent. So here, we've decided what's educationally equivalent. We've got small integers between 2 and 5. We've got a monic quadratic with no coefficient here. We've got no coefficient there. That's just, just a 1. And we've decided that's the way we're going to do it. So using the computer algorithm in the background to set questions is essential to maintain educational equivalence and also in many cases to provide easy access to the steps in the work solution. You do everything backwards and you look for invariance of the work solution. And if for your students you need to provide a different work solution, then basically it's probably for them a different question and you should write a different question and assess a different question, I would say. And if you want to sample your students, then you can just randomly select questions from a list rather than generating complicated questions. So simple random questions and selecting questions from the list is, is, I think, the most effective way. The CAS is also used to establish validity of answers and display them, and to seek properties of the answers. So we had a question a moment ago about um, x squared. So who asked that question? It was Linda. Linda asked the difference between x squared plus a half 
and x x squared plus one over two. Well, in some senses these expressions are the same, and in other senses they're different. So one is an expanded form, and one we've got a factor of a half taken out. And it may be that they um, maybe the property the teacher wants is algebraic equivalence, in which case both would be acceptable. Maybe the goal of the question in elementary algebra is to actually expand out the division and distribute that division over addition and uh, actually, oh no, well they're not even equivalent, are they? Sorry, it's in the mood. Wouldn't be, okay, so if, if we had instead, if we had uh, x squared over 2 plus a half versus X, X. I think I misinterpreted Linda's suggestion. Uh, I think maybe Linda you're talking about syntax rather than semantics. I'm putting this in the chat, um, so I put some things in the chat. So those expressions are equivalent, but they're not the same. So the computer algebra system is used to establish those properties. In some situations, equivalence might be the property you're looking for. In other situations, you might want a stricter sense of the same. You might really might want the student to uh, have, a, have distributed division over addition, and that might be the goal of the question. And then based on that, we want to generate feedback. So we want to manipulate the student's answers to generate that feedback based on student's answers. We want to generate work solutions, which involve steps in the working, and we need analysis of the answers. So the computer algebra system is key for all of those things. I do want to talk about notation, and I think notation is really important. And thank you for those people who have contributed in the chat. Uh, so thank you for those people who suggested we do with editors and so on. Before we get on to the actual mechanics of entering an answer, I think it's worth pausing just to think about the notation and what it means, because every editor is going to have to make decisions on what the, what the notation actually means. And I think that's not discussed as often as it could be, and I think it's overlooked. And I'm not the first person to comment on this. Babbage, Charles Babbage, wrote a lot about notation. It was, I think it, what he wrote is very interesting. It's been almost entirely ignored. He, uh, I could quote him at length, but I won't. His quote here, examples of the power of a well-contrived notation to condense into a small space of meaning which would in ordinary language require several lines or pages, can hardly escape the notice of most of my readers. And it's this business of meaning that's really the key word for me here. What does the notation actually mean? So in designing a syntax or stack, a type syntax, I've had to make some design decisions. And if we were designing a WYSIWYG editor, we would equally have to make these design decisions. Whatever input technique we decide to use for our students, there are design decisions to be made. For example, do we require a star for multiplication? I mean, are we going to re require 3 times x rather than 3x? Well, for some groups of students, they need to learn the syntax, so 3 star x is important. For other groups of students, that's just not, not mis that's mystifying. So in stack, there is an option to insert stars automatically where that's unambiguous, and there's an option to um, reject that as invalid. So stack does provide some syntax options. Um, grouping students definitely need to group their terms rather than writing. I mean, there's a, there is a big difference between 2 to the x plus 1 and 2 to the x plus 1. I've used some intonation there in my voice to group. Um, no, we can't use a blank for multiplication um, because Greg earlier forgot to put a blank in for function application. So um, if we have implied multiplication, that could be interpreted as a multiplication. There are some real, there are some real ambiguities in traditional notation that we just don't discuss, and, and this, this, this application forces you to be very precise. I think that's a good thing. I think that's a strength. Our students should learn to communicate unambiguously. So I don't shy away from that. We do something we absolutely explicitly have to teach. So the design decision in stack, and it's a design decision, is not to allow space. And you. you um, you may disagree with that, sorry, but there we go. But there are lots of other issues. Um, special numbers, pi, is it a variable name, is it i, is it j, gamma, all sorts of things. Typing in matrices needs a syntax. What do we do about inverse trig things? Yes, indeed. Uh, humans handle ambiguities, but students don't. And then there are cultural differences. 
my European colleagues would like to use the comma as a decimal separator. But under, underneath, I basically stuck to maximum syntax. So I've made some, and uh, yeah, I, I, yes, I agree, Greg. I think students are getting more used to this. So um, there we go. So we get now come on to this issue of validation versus correctness. I mean, there is a default is to require students to validate in the way I've demonstrated that echoes the student's answer back in normal notation. And it's tied to the input. In multi-part questions, the validation is tied to the input. This does basic syntax checks. Um, so if they're missing brackets, if they've got spaces in their expression, it gets rejected. I haven't written a full parser, but it would be great if we could write a full parser. If we wrote a full parser, that would allow more options and for other people to uh, to contribute would be great. So if anyone would like to write a full parser in PHP, that would be very much appreciated. Reasons for invalidity? Well, syntax problems like missing brackets. Use of floating point numbers might render a question invalid. I know students often type 0.5 uh, instead of x over 2. That's fine. That's, that's mean to half, but uh, 0.33x versus x over 3, they are different. So by default, stack rejects all floating points as invalid rather than wrong and tells the students to just to do it again. Rational numbers in lowest terms can be re rejected as invalid and uh, the, the invalidity has consequences for the way that penalties are assessed. So you can enforce these cultural conventions about how we express mathematics without imposing numerical penalties. You can just say to the students, it's invalid, I'm not even going to think about it, cancel your fractions, put your numbers into rational numbers, don't put floating points in, and so on. These are all options that the teacher can choose can choose to have or not. Let me know. And I'm very open to suggestions of other options that I haven't thought about. Once the system has decided that the expression is valid, then it can be considered whether or not it's correct. And this is all about articulating the properties. As a teacher, you have to articulate the properties you want. And I've shown some examples of that already. And there are normally many properties. In an individual question, you're going to establish a range of different properties. You might want the answer to be equivalent to a correct answer, and stack has four different senses in which expressions are equivalent or not. And you also might want to check the form of the answer, and then you might check for some common mistakes. So in this question that we looked at earlier, just to remind you, here I've got it right, look, there's the nice smooth cubic spline. There are two options. You can either check the algebraic equivalence with the correct answer, or as I've chosen to do, you can check each of these four properties separately and provide feedback. So the teacher has to decide what are the essential properties for that question, and then the teacher has to decide what are simply background conventions. And it may be that the form of your answer is a background convention rather than an important goal for that question. And what the teacher does is to end up writing a flowchart, a tree that establishes the properties. So we've dropped the integral sign there, so we're just going to draw the integral sign back in. If you're asking the teacher to, student, sorry, if you're asking the student to find this indefinite integral, um, you would draw a flowchart and you'll have a number of tests. And depending on the outcomes of these tests, you'll give feedback. So if the students um, have got it, yeah, I'm not going to go through all that, but the teacher essentially uh, has to write a little flowchart to establish the properties that they want to and is relevant to the question. This requires a new mindset from teachers. You, you, you don't just look at the answer and go, is that okay? You really have to be upfront in advance. What makes this question correct? If they've got it wrong, what feedback would I, would I like? And that's a, that's, a, that's a certain sophistication here. So really, the teachers have to, you know, it's just a sensible thing is to start by modifying someone else's questions. And there are plenty of examples. One of the key design features that it's a separation between validation and correctness in the multi-part questions. And there's a complete disconnect between the inputs and the algorithms which establish the properties. So in that, that multi-part question, I give examples, there were four parts. There were four input elements. And then behind the scenes, there are four separate algorithms which establish the properties. And the one algorithm is tied to the first input. The second algorithm is tied to the second input, and so on. But in the question where we asked the, the algebra question, find the rectangle, there's one algorithm that looks at the first input that says, have you got the right equation? And then to implement follow through marking, the second algorithm reply, relies on the first and the second inputs. So these algorithms are um, 
fired off, they're executed when every input element on which they rely is valid. And there's a complete separation between the algorithms and the inputs, and that's a key design decision. So you could have an input which has no algorithm. That's a survey, in fact, and that's perfectly, that's perfectly respectable. You just survey your students. You don't establish any properties. You just want a valid expression from them, and that's, that's perfectly incorporated naturally within this design. Uh, it looks a bit counterintuitive the first time you see it, but it allows you... I can't think of a sensible assessment regime that this doesn't incorporate, so um, that, that is why we did it. So uh, here's a, here is just a reminder of that question before. There are four separate inputs. Validity is tied to inputs. I've put the correctness feedback, which is tied to the algorithms, next to them. You can put these bits of feedback anywhere you like. This input element is a multiple choice input element, that's fair enough, and uh, that has an algorithm. And sorry I'm overrunning Matthew, I appreciate that. Follow through marking is naturally incorporated. And uh, we come to server load. I mean, the, the, the Achilles heel of this whole thing is that the CAS is a significant server load. So we have bought a massive server, and it's absolutely fine for formative assessment, but. Um, this is a problem, and if you run a, a high-stakes summative exam with an end time, and you have 200 students clicking submit at the end of the day, uh, the server is absolutely clobbered, and that's a potential problem. So I just want to be entirely upfront about that. The server load is a problem. So that brings me to the end. If you want to automate something like mathematical assessment, then um, you have to understand what you want to do. It's a sophisticated tool, and teachers need a new mindset. Random questions are an under, undervalued professional activity, I think. It's kind of interesting, interesting mathematically. Articulating the properties you want is a central issue, and I think that's really improved my teaching. Even when I'm giving oral feedback to students in paper-based things, I'm much more aware what is essential to make this question correct, and how, how can I help the students understand what this question is really asking. Furthermore, I think this is here to say, and, um, and um, we're going to see a lot more of this from publishers, from textbook authors, from online sites. Stack is just of its class. There are plenty of other things around. So I think I'm going to take questions here, and I apologize that I've overrun a bit, but uh, there's quite a lot here. I appreciate people are rushing off. I'm sorry I've run a little bit. I'm coming in from Australia, but I've got a like a river sounding behind me, so I hope it's not my river. Um, I just wanted to say thanks, Chris, and uh, one of the academics, uh, Kerry Cullis, may be in touch. She's very interested in this, but was unable to come at this time. Um, her, her educational designer. Thanks, Melina. You're coming through fine. Um, I'm sorry, Kerry, you thank you for your comment and uh, I, I would very much welcome contact from your colleagues and from anyone else who's listening. Thank you very much for your interest. I'd like this to be a community project. I mean, I'm confident the new version of the software is working well. The server load is an issue, but um, you know, that's, that's true of other systems too. We just have to fix that. And so yeah, please, um, please do get in contact.
Yeah, Melina's coming in, I think. Hi, I just wanted to say I wish I had maths like this when I did it at uni back in the 70s. I know you talked about the 60s with Hollingworth, but we had a chalk and talk and it was just check, 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 and then you got practice problems and you all had the same practice problems, all had a shoot on the Friday and they're all due Monday at 10 a.m. I just wish I'd had this range of problems myself. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, we still do plenty of chalk and talk, so I'm sure that hasn't gone away entirely, but we're moving in another direction. Mark, then, yes, there will be a recording. I'm sure Matthew will be able to provide us with that. Um, Samson, yes, other, other, um, other learning management systems, I'm sure there are. I know that um, there are some commercial things available, WebCT, for example, um, uh, sorry, Maple TA, but MapleSoft have, a, uh, MapleSoft have a commercial system which, which is in very much the same direction as Stack, and um, I think they've integrated with some commercial uh, content management systems. There are a whole range of things around. Yep, someone else has mentioned Desire to Learn, I've come across that. Um, if we can flick back a, a, um, a slide, sorry Matthew, I hope that's okay. I've, I've written a book about this, Computer Education of Mathematics, which is published by Oxford University Press, the typescripts with the publisher, and so that will be out next year. And in that book I've, I've surveyed a number of other things around, not just my system. There's been a lot of reinvention over the last 10 years, a lot of people working in parallel, and there's now a community of practice in this area. But there isn't a lot of communication. So I hope this will try and address that. There are a lot of very good things about, and um, some of them are commercial, some of them are open source, and uh, I think that's, um, that's all to the good, really. So I hope you can find something for your particular content management system, for your learning management system. Yes, Greg, thanks. Yes, 9 p.m. Well, it's 8 a.m. here, so I'm, uh, the sun is coming up. It's looking beautiful on campus, and I shall, uh, I shall go for breakfast when we're done as well. So, so thanks for your interest, Greg. Yes, there are language translations. The nice thing about Moodle is that um, we're inside the Moodle translation system. Um, we've already got translations for Finnish, Swedish. Um, I know people are working on Italian and German if that hasn't been finished already. Uh, we would very much welcome translations. If you'd like some advice on that, the Moodle community is very supportive. So the whole of stack can be translated through the normal Moodle system. And um, so that was another big advantage of going in with Moodle. So yes, languages, please, please. You'll still have to offer your own questions, I'm afraid. But if you'd like to release some sample questions of those educational resources, then, then we'd be very happy to host those. Uh, in English, there are about 350 calculus and algebra questions that you, you uh, automatically get when you, when you get stacked. So there's things to get started with. So if you, if you don't want to write your own questions, there's plenty of materials to start with that you can use with your students. But languages, absolutely.
Oh, I might not have been on. I was saying thanks, Matthew, for this because moderating is such a hard thing to do and it takes a lot of time and I know you're very committed to this and thanks to Chris because mathematics is such a uh, difficult thing to do in most learning management systems. Okay, folks, I think we'll call it a day. Um, it's ten past the hour. Six, 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 ten, where I am in Brisbane, Australia. And Chris wants to go and get his breakfast. Um, so what I'm going to do is stop the recording at this point and hopefully see a lot of you in the next session in December. Thank you, and night or good morning, or if you have a day. Well, thank you, Matthew, for inviting me. Thank you to everyone for participating, and uh, I'd be very happy to receive emails.